speak for a lot of people, though I shouldn't say that. I want to listen. <laughs> like, will you talk to me about how you feel when you see George Floyd and this happen? I mean, what, where were you when it happened? What did you think? What went through your mind? I want to listen. Honestly, man, like, it's compounded trauma for me in this way. I hadn't fully digested the incident in Georgia before now we're on to another black man. I mean, you can't run. Apparently yesterday, you know, you can't walk your, you can't ask people to walk their dog on a leash either. I mean, it's just, so for me, I, I think one of the things that I, I, my friends, especially my white brothers and sisters across the globe and different people in different ethnicities, I try to remind them that the lament that we feel is not situational. It's not just, why are they responding this way? It's like, no, you don't understand. Like, black bodies have been in jeopardy since they were transported from their country, ripped from their homes, and sold as property, commodified in America. So this is not new. Um, and, and so, you know, last night, to be honest with you, Coco and I were numb. Um, we had been working all day. Um, we had been serving the community, doing the things we do. And I watched my wife get emotional, cry, go to her room, lay down, wanted to be by herself. Um, wow. It's just difficult. Very wow. difficult. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, I called you and you're like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> Will you talk well, about tomorrow with me a little bit more? Yeah, I know, right? Um, yeah. You know, I see, I think, um, you know, I have so many friends that are pastors, right? So my you know, the people that I choose to follow online and stuff on like Instagram and social, like it's a lot of pastors speaking up. And as a pastor, you, you know, you know this, like you don't want to comment on every single current event that goes down because we don't want to live, a, we don't want to have a reactionary platform. Is that okay to say? Like we're yeah. about lifting up the name of Jesus. And, and if you just react to everything, then, then, then if everything's important, nothing's important. Right. right. So, right. When I, I'm seeing a lot of pastors and white leaders say, you know, speak up, does that in any, way, in any way move the meter? How do you feel when you see people speaking up? Yeah, I, you know, so, so first let me just say to you, um, we've gone through a, a period of time where the church was apps. The church has always been complicit in, in the racism that we see, the systemic racism that exists. And primarily, unpack, unpack that a little bit, brother. <laughs> uh, let's let's just let's not let's not forget that our founding fathers, while they were creating these great documents that we all espouse that they have great potential for a great society, we were not human. We were property while that was going on. It was not mm. written for or to us. So, um, when, you know, I hear people say, "Let's make America great again," and I'm thinking, like, like who was it great for? And where are we trying to go? Are we trying to go back to Jim Crow? What, what are we trying to go back to slavery? When, when was America that great for everybody? It's never been. It, it's, it's an idea. I've served as a US, you know, you know I have, as a Marine. So I believe I'm a patriot. I love our country. And yet we've fallen short in bringing equality um, for everyone. And so when I see our brothers and sisters um, commenting, our white brothers and sisters primarily, I'm like, there's a part of me that's like, yes, they're, they're, they're making comments, they're posting, they're, whatever they're doing in their particular platforms. And then at the same time, I got to be honest. I'm like, where you been? Where, where have you been? We've been saying this. And, and apparently when black people say it, we're exaggerating. It's not the truth. As if, you know, when I hear people say, well, if they didn't resist, the police, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be killed. They wouldn't, the, these, this abuse of power wouldn't exist if we didn't, uh, if we just submitted to authority. I'm thinking, you can't possibly look at Eric Garner um, asking for air like our brother did again. So if you didn't believe Eric Garner, like now again, a black man dies while asking for air, the permission to breathe. Um, so yes, I'm grateful. I'm finally grateful because I think it's going to take all of us to move more than because because here's what I'm I, I said yes to you, but I said no to maybe 50 other conversations that people want to have, because I think 
A lot of our white brothers and sisters think that if we've had the conversation, they can check the box and feel like they did something toward reconciliation. And here's what I would say to you. We've got to do more. Because I remember, I grew up in the church. Remember Promise Keepers? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, they had these reconciliation rallies at Promise Keepers where black men and different men would get on the stage and they would have the white brothers wash their feet and they would sing Kumbaya and everybody would feel good. And the only problem with that is that moment is good and necessary and a part of it. But then we did not go back to our communities. We did not go to our communities of faith and our communities and work proactively to dismantle systems. I was about systemic, to say that. It's a systemic injustice. Yeah. That's what we don't approach. And, and that's where, because, I mean, justice, let's just think about it. We're gospel people, right? We're if gospel we say people. that people are irreparably broken, in desperate need of a savior, dead people need to be made alive, Jesus does that. If we believe that, then we also have to believe every system that has been created by a man is flawed and broken. So is it that far of a leap to believe that systemic racism exists? So, um... I'm grateful. I'm seeing more of our white pastors, friends, denominational leaders coming. I'm just, that's, I'm, I'm divided. I have to be honest. I'm divided. There's a part of me that's like, man, thank you. Thank you for saying it because I'm tired. I haven't posted anything. I haven't said anything. I'm like, I'm done. Um, y'all, y'all have the conversation because the rest of us, we know <laughs> what's going on. And so I'm happy. And then the other side, other side of me is, is a low grade anger. Um, yeah about having to still have this conversation again. So. I was uh, on a run the other day and <clears throat> I was talking to the Lord and I, it was when um, Ahmaud Arbery had lost, it was remember on his birthday when everybody did the run? Yes. And everybody's posting uh, the, the two point whatever, you know, and uh, I, I was asking the Lord, why are people so, particularly outraged, you know, and why now is there this like run happening and all this stuff. And, and he so clearly spoke to me, Keith, he said, I, I put, I put the cry of redemption in the heart of every man. He's like, every person wants to believe that it's going to be okay. Every person like wants to believe that everything will be made right. Like we want to believe in redemption. Like we're desperate for redemption. We want to believe right. that pain doesn't have to be wasted. And I think that when people go on the runs and when they post this, they're trying to say, I want to do what I can to kind of like make it like worth it, you know, or make it like, I want to redeem it. Like if enough people go on a run and talk about it, maybe that makes his, his, his death maybe worth something, you know, or make it, maybe it just kind of moves him. Does that make sense? It, at the it same time, I think, yeah, at the same time, I think that like we can do, we can do a post or we can do a run. Yeah. And then what? Exactly. That's why yeah. I think it's still We're like, right. oh, okay. I, I did my part, you know? I think it's conceived in the right place. I think, I think a lot of what drives some of those movements that you see, quite frankly, and this might be hard to hear, but it's, it's a lot of guilt, white guilt. And so um, a lot of times when white guilt is expressed, we as a black community, we don't get to voice as, as the victim and as those that are oppressed. And not just, let's just not make it, because you and I believe it's a gospel thing, let's just, if it's me too, it's women that, that have not been championed and advocated for, and it's immigration, it's all of those things that, that, that sort of epitomize our brokenness. But in this particular area of race, I mean, I, we gotta do something, because if you're a white community and you're thinking, you're the you have the majority culture. You're like, I didn't do it. I'm in it immediately. White fragility. I'm not a racist, and and I I I I'm appalled at that. Yeah, I know you are, and yet you have benefited, maybe knowingly or unknowingly, from the systems that have been put in place that have made these atrocities common. Because if you go back to Jim Crow lynching, black black bodies being murdered is not new. This is our history, and um, I think to really embrace that, so think about it. Let me go for a run. Let me make a post, because I can at least feel like I'm doing something. I got you, and that's, that's, that's the step. You have to, what I would say is you're at the base of the mountain. Now you're ready to climb. When you start being vocal and saying something out loud, great. Now you're doing what we've always done. 
But now the hard work comes in of climbing that mountain of reconciliation, dealing with systems, dealing with one's own complicity in those systems. All of that has to be done. And when you start going down that trail, it really becomes very difficult, hurtful, painful. I have, let me tell you this real quick. John McIntosh is a friend of mine up in, up in Washington, white guy, lived in a community that served the community. And he called me uncontrollably sobbing. Mm. And I, I couldn't understand him for like a couple of minutes. He collected himself. And what happened was, is he realized that what he was seeing in our culture, he is a part of it. He didn't yeah. do it. He didn't originate it, but he is a part of it. And as a man of God, he was lamenting to me and saying, tell me what to do. Right. And um, we had a great conversation as a result. Well, I mean, what is, okay, as a, as a, as a human being, number one, as a man, as a yeah. husband, as a father, uh, I represent a family unit. I'm training my kids intentionally. I'm raising them. Um, I'm a leader. Um, what are, what are, what's helpful and, and what's harmful? Is there anything that we do? Like, what's one thing that's like, hey, that's contributing to the sy systemic injustice, right? And is there anything that's actually like, you're particularly like, you know, that, that right there, that was sweet. That right there yeah. had some value to it. Like, is there anything that we could hear from you? Um, you? You know, one of the things that would really help, and and I think all of us can do it. And, and so we got some people that's watching us, people listen to us. Here's one thing. When you see inequality, injustice happening in your space, in your neighborhood, at your Target, wherever it is that you are, at your coffee shop, and you see it, and you, you see it for what it is, you cannot engage. You have to speak to it out loud. And especially if our white brothers and sisters do. And 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 there's Randy Remington, our, our new president, is a great friend of mine. And you know, we served together. But he was in the airport recently. And um, two white guys said under their breath as he was in this little space with a bunch of other white people. And there was a man, a black man, upset at the counter for whatever reason. He says, see, they're so emotional. That's what they do. Randy ov overheard it and, and engaged vigorously and said, I wonder if you would say that out loud for everybody in this terminal to hear. Like literally made that wow. scene. Shame them. They so much so, they got up and left. And, and honestly, it brought tears to my eyes because I thought to myself, what if we all, not just for black and white issues, wherever we saw injustice, especially those of us who are supposed to be of the new humanity, those of us that have learned a new way of being human through Jesus Christ, right? Gospel. Gospel. So if we began to be the contrast community that we're supposed to be in the world and began to speak up and speak out, not just on social media. That's, come on, man, you could be a thumb thug on social media and nobody know who you are. You know what I'm saying? Come on, you're a thug because you got, you got your thumbs moving. No, no, no. But you, in where it costs you, where it could cost you friends and relationships and, and, and your own comfort to really engage when people are being mistreated, when somebody says what, something about it. What's that called when you do something at a personal cost for huh. a group? What's that called? Somebody, it, self sacrifice? Gospel. Self, gospel. Come on, you can't read Philippians 2 and not come out, not come away with. Man, let me prefer my brother before myself. The Bible says that Jesus made himself nothing. Yeah. Made himself nothing. So, uh, anyway, do you get me started now? No, I mean, I, I, it's refreshing to, 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 to um, thank you for agreeing to take this conversation. I know you said you turned down 50 other conversations. I'm sure uh, we just want, to, I want to make a difference somehow feeling a little lost, Pastor, like feeling a little lost. And I know it starts with listening, right? But I'm just like, wow, I was sick to my stomach yesterday, man. Maria was sick to my son, her stomach. I mean, it was just a week ago, I was talking to my oldest son, who's 10 years old, about Ahmed Aubrey, you know? And I made, I, made, I made the moment happen. And I said, what do you think would happen, son, if it was two white guys, you know, if it was two black guys chasing a white guy down the street in a truck? And his, his eyes... You know, um, he got it. He just he got, got it. it. Like, oh, like, 
So even at, and, and he is raised in a home like where there is, we don't, my, my son is half Mexican. I don't know if you know this, okay? And so <laughs> there is a, there is a, in, in the house, you know, there's like the Mexican rule, which is like, if you get up and you leave your seat open and somebody jumps in and gets the seat, my wife calls that the Mexican rule. Like you can have your seats taken, right? And the other day, uh, they jumped up and took my seat, and, uh, and, and, and and then Logan was like, oh, it, it's, you know, dad's not Mexican, so it doesn't count. Doesn't and I, count. And I, and I, told, I told my son, I said, hey, not everybody gets to be Mexican. Don't make people feel bad. And, like, there's this thing, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, we don't, we don't, call, we don't, like, you don't say, you know, like, I'm sure people have said to you, Oh, Keith's not black. He's the whitest black guy. You know what I mean? And I, and I remember someone saying, I'm like, why would you, what does that mean? Does that mean that like, like, it's, like, is that supposed to be a compliment or an insult? Like, what is that? Yeah. So I, I, I don't know. I think as a father raising my kids, I'm trying to yeah. like think through that. But as a human being, yeah. social mannerisms and behaviors, uh, social media behaviors, anything else that we can listen to today from you, from your perspective, that yeah, would there's, there's contribute. There's a couple of things that come to mind when I, there's a couple of my things that come to mind while you and I are chatting. Like, I remember um, Dr. Mark Laberton, um, the president of Fuller Theological Seminary, wrote a book called "The Dangerous Act of Loving Your Neighbor," and and I'll never forget this quote because it, it just is so apropos for where we live. He said that being human is no guarantee of humanity, and mm. and I just thought about that for the longest time. I I just don't even. When you look at the scene, like my wife t cringed and turned away from the TV. She couldn't watch it. I couldn't um, watch it. Mm -hmm. The sound of his distress, for whatever reason, think about it for a minute. T to be a police officer in that moment means, okay, they, they deal with the worst of society on a daily basis so we don't have to. And yet they, they have to remain humane in how they treat people. And for some reason, these officers were able to stand around hear the cries of the crowd, and then ignore the cries of, of the human being now in front of them. And, and I think one of the things, quite frankly, that concerns me is that we're not looked at as, as equal human beings. Our image is not as equal as the white flesh is. And, and here's why. Remember in the shooting uh, of the church Bible study and, and the young man, the white young man who shot the Bible study up, right? The police took him to get a sandwich on the way to jail because he looked like what one of their sons would have looked like. If this was a black man, there is no, on the way to take him to jail, they had enough humanity to say, he might be hungry. Even though he murdered people, he might be hungry. Let's get him a sandwich. And yet black people die in custody all the time. They figure out a way to deescalate uh, situations. Can you imagine you just seen on the news where people were at their city governments and federal gov federal buildings with AR-15 strung over their shoulders crying for their right to go to church. Could you imagine such a rally of African Americans and Latinos with guns at any rally anywhere in America and it not be violent? So, I, you know, I, I love what you said about Logan and being able to bring it home because that's where it starts. Racism is taught. This stuff is prejudice is taught. This is where it goes. And so um, there is an organization that I want to shout out while I got while we got people on. And right. uh, my boy Gabe Barrero and I, we've talked to them. We use them. It's the be the bridge dot org, be the bridge dot org organization. Um, educate yourself, read, um, get in, get into some groups. If your circle group, your friend group is not diverse, you live in SoCal. So you and I have friends that live in communities that are white. So it's very difficult to go have a meal and to build relationships with, because proximity, man, that creates, you know, that type of empathy and compassion for people that are different. But man, we got to get in, we got to get in, learn our history, learn about one another. And um, I, there's a white daughter of mine who said, she said, we just got to love better. Yeah. She was just broken. We just got to love better. Be the bridge.com. Sorry. Be the bridge.com. So anyway, you stir me up in a good way. I, I've seen you live this out, Keith. I've seen you stand up for people who can't stand up for themselves in a number of different 
arenas not n- not just not just ethnic but i've seen yeah. you stand up for people that you know and i've seen you do it so many times that i just i find hope like if we could all have the courage i'm hearing from you that to tolerate it you know in person when we see these moments happen that's that's number one anything else be the bridge dot, dot org i'm hearing that is that correct be the bridge dot org dot com dot com so they, they've got it um, the, I guess the other thing would be is um, go to the other. You know what I mean? Like one of the things that I love about our relationship is it's mutual. It's reciprocal. And um, I think if we could spend time with one another, because, you know, we get confirmation bias being around the people that are saying all of the same 100%. things, you know, 100%. <laughs> constantly all around. You know, we all listen to Fox News or we all listen yeah. to CNN. We all got the same thing. And social media plays into that with their algorithms and keeps us all frenzied together, polarized. But, um, you know, and just the last thought is there's a thing that when I passed it in L.A., the gang interventionists, in order to bring gangs together, used a social, uh, social psychology or social science approach with contact theory. They brought people together right. who are at odds and bring them in close proximity. And they find out that they're, they've got some of the same wants needs um and and they start building bridges to one another that's what i want i want bridges and not walls come on man so you so so do you think jesus knew what he was doing when he built the church where he insists on we're around people every week who aren't like us socioeconomically i mean i mean beyond beyond those obvious things generationally Um, uh ethnically uh being in church, is it safe to say that is helpful? I mean, do you believe the church putting bro, people in a room with people who aren't like each other? Bro, bro, it, think about what you just asked me. This Sunday coming is Pentecost Sunday. Yeah. This outpouring happened and all of the people that heard, all these different ethnicities heard the gospel, the glory of God in their own language. Yes, the church is that place, the contrast community where where we get to intersect people who aren't like us, don't have our narrative, don't have our perspective, and yet we have one thing only maybe in common, and that's Jesus, and that's enough. Jesus knew what he was doing. He was helping us, wasn't he? He, he really was. He really I tell him the story this Sunday on Pentecost about how when I first came to church, I was the only white guy in the church. I tell a great <laughs> story about that, being the only white guy, you know? Yeah. And, At Maria's um, dad's church? Yeah, Maria's dad's church. Yeah. And the truth is, is that God doesn't want us just to, you know, experience his love, but he wants us to extend his love. And if, if you are uncomfortable around people who are not like you right now, come on, heaven's going to be super uncomfortable because the kingdom of God is Real super talk. diverse. Let's Real practice talk. now. Would you pray for us? Yeah, let's pray. So, Lord, um, we couldn't pray a better prayer than the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17 in such I a divisive and polarized <laughs> um, time. Um, Lord, we agree with Jesus. Um, yes. First of all, we confess that we're not one. We confess that there are all walls, there are classes, there are labels, there are stereotypes that um, we place on people, that we judge people after the flesh and not after their hearts and spirits. God, we just ask you now to give us eyes, new eyes, new vision, to Amen. see the new humanity, to see the image of God in each and every human being we come into contact with, even if that image is so distorted and so marred by brokenness, God, let us Amen. be able to see some facet of your image in that person and then speak to it and then engage them accordingly, that everyone has intrinsic value that has been created in your image. And so, Lord, use us. The Bible says, Paul very plainly says in 2 Corinthians 5, that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are those that have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And now we are sent into the world as your agents. And so Lord, um, empower us, strengthen us. The day of Pentecost is coming. Uh, We celebrate it annually. And so that is that moment where the gospel um, literally took flight. You make us one by the spirit and you bring every tribe and every tongue around your throne as a result. Use us God in this time to heal our country, and to lift up one another. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being a pastor and a friend and a father that we can admire. Thank you for sharing your own pain and
helping us listen. Thank you for helping Amen. us listen. Anything I can do for you, always, you know it. Love, Love you, Pastor. All right, bye-bye.